Hi there. Welcome to How It Works, the show that takes you inside the objects and things that you use every day in your life and shows you how they actually work. Have you ever wondered how a cell phone lets you talk to someone on the other side of the world? Or a microwave heats your food? Or a tiny bulb can light an entire room or control traffic? Well, over the coming weeks, we're going to show you exactly how these modern miracles of science occur and how they were invented. And today we're going to begin with the simple invention and operation of the light bulb. A light bulb is a device that converts electrical energy into visible light. We've all heard that before, but what does that mean and what is a light bulb really? We've all seen and operated electrical light bulbs all our lives and taken for granted this amazing miracle that results when we flip a switch and suddenly illuminate a room, a house or a city. But how does this amazing alchemy occur? Well, today we're going to learn not only where the phenomenon of electrical light started, but how incandescent bulbs work to light our world and to keep us entertained. Every kind of bulb helps light up a scene and illuminates the things that you see on the screen. The phenomenon of the electrical light bulb started when Sir Joseph Swan and American Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in 1878 and 1879. Within a quarter century, millions of people around the world had electrical lighting installed in their homes. It took years of research and experiments with different materials to find the material which had the longest life while glowing brightly enough to give out visible light. The metal tungsten was found to be the best. In 1860, Swan displayed the original incandescent light bulb. However, his light bulb didn't have a strong enough vacuum to last long and his batteries couldn't produce enough current to generate incandescent. Fifteen years later, he returned and by 1878, he produced a working prototype. Of course, the downside of inventing lights is what happens when they go off unexpectedly. Ow! I love living the Brighton life. Look at the illustrious illumination of the lights that shine so bright like a new moon and make midnight seem like quarter to noon. Help us view and see at night at the flick of a switch at the speed of light. From Monday to Sunday, the airplane, the runway, Edison knew we would light the night someday. So inventing the light bulb may have taken a lot of work, but today it remains one of the most dependent upon and easy to use elements of technology. And today we'll show you how it works. An incandescent bulb uses heat caused by an electrical current. When electrical current passes through a wire, it causes the wire to heat. The wire, or filament, gets so hot that it glows and gives off light. At the first stage of the process, we flick a switch. When we flick that switch, an electrical pulse passes through a wire along the wall to the light fixture. Once the current reaches the light fixture, it passes through a wire or filament in the incandescent bulb made of tungsten. Electricity arrives at the bulb, hits the filament, heats up the filament. The filament's temperature in a standard 75 or 100 watt, 120 volt bulb is roughly 2550 degrees Celsius or roughly 4600 degrees Fahrenheit. It must be placed in a sealed glass bulb which is either evacuated or filled with a gas that won't let it burn. A fluorescent lamp is a glass tube filled with argon gas and mercury. When electrical current is passed through the gas, the atoms of the gas pick up energy and radiate it in the form of ultraviolet light and heat. The UV light then strikes the inside of the tube which is coated with a phosphor. The phosphor glows, giving off the light we see. And in that way, it's not unlike the phosphorescence some marine life gives off when we see those glowing shapes in the water. But that is how the miracle of light is created by humans. Electricity traveling through a wire, heating up a filament and gases inside a bulb, creating UV light and a phosphorescent glow. Have you ever used an aerosol? Well, if you're not sure if you have, ask yourself, have you used an insect repellent? or hairspray, or gotten whipped cream from a can? Can I just keep, can I just keep going like a yeah, madman? Yeah. If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you've used an aerosol. But what is an aerosol? Hey! What's turning these substances into a spray or foam, and how are they projected out of the can? 
The aerosol is actually a cloud of solid or liquid particles in a gas that comes out of an aerosol container. Aerosol spray is a dispensing system which creates an aerosol mist of liquid particles. This aerosol technology can be attached to any container, plastic, bottle or metal. Aerosols are widely used and have generally made life a little easier with applications of paint, oil, lubricants, insecticides, medicines and a lot more. Or if you worked out in the gym and realised there's not just your muscles getting stronger, it's practical and some people consider it artistic. But where does this technology come from? Who invented it and how does it work? Shaving cream sprays to help you shave While hairspray gives you the style for the day WD-40 makes things not squeak And whipping cream sweet and delicious to eat Air fresheners make the room smell great Plus graffiti art is made with spray paint They're sanitizing sprays that make a place cleanly But most aerosol sprays are ozone friendly The forerunner of the aerosol can and valve was invented by Eric Rotheim of Norway in 1927. During the Second World War, the US government funded research into portable ways for servicemen to spray malaria carrying bugs, and in 1944, the Department of Agriculture researchers developed a small aerosol can pressurized by liquefied gas. Their designs led way to today's commercial spray products. The clog free valve was invented by Robert H. Amplinel in 1953. In 1949, Bonnie Seymour suggested the use of an aerosol can filled with paint to her husband. Edward H. Seymour not only invented the first aerosol spray can for paint, he went ahead and founded a company in Chicago, USA, which is still in operation today. While the technology has evolved, aerosols remain very similar to the first prototype, patented by Eric Rotheim. The basic technique is one fluid stored under high pressure is used to propel another fluid out of a can. An aerosol can contains one fluid called the propellant that boils well below room temperature and one that boils at a much higher temperature. This is known as the product. The propellant is the means of getting the product out of the sealed can. In the simpler form of aerosol packaging, the liquid product is poured in and the can is sealed. Then the propellant is poured in through the valve at high pressure so it pushes down the product and maintains the high pressurization used to force the product up the dip tube, past the valve and out through the nozzle. Generally aerosol cans start with a small depressible head also known as the plunger with a narrow channel running through to the inside of the can. A spring pushes the headpiece up so the channel is blocked by a tight seal. The dip tube is attached to the end of this head unit. When you push down the headpiece, the spring is depressed and the valve is open. The high pressure propellant gas drives the product up the plastic tube and out through the narrow nozzle. A loudspeaker is a transducer which converts electrical energy into acoustic energy or electrical signals into sound. Sound is the signal your ears send to your brain for interpretation. We've all listened to music or heard the soundtracks of films, videos or TV shows many times in our lives, whether on television, stereos, iPods and at live music venues. It seems everywhere we turn in our modern world, we're met with a barrage of sound pumping out the latest song or show, movie or commercial. You can pick the top selling artist, record and encode on state of the art equipment but if you play it back on equipment without good loudspeakers, it's garbage. The same applies to movies, video games and portable devices. Basically, the quality and condition of the speakers matters. In fact, it's become so commonplace to hear amplified sound in the modern world that most of us probably don't even think about the scientific forces at work to make it possible. But it wasn't always so. In fact, until the mid-1800s, the only way people could hear music was played live, and the only thing they heard was the volume generated by the musicians' instruments or voices. And that's why opera and vaudeville were such popular art forms, because the singers were trained to project their voices without microphone or speakers inside a theatre, and you would have to have a loud voice to be heard. But all that began to change in the early 1860s, when Johann Philipp Rees installed an electrical loudspeaker on his telephone. 
German Ernst Siemens then patented the first loudspeaker on April 14, 1874. And in 1881, Thomas Edison received a British patent for a system using compressed air as an amplifying mechanism for his early cylinder phonographs. In 1898, Horace Short patented a design for a loudspeaker driven by compressed air. He sold the rights to Charles Parsons, who received several additional British patents. Several companies produced record players using the compressed air loudspeaker technology. However, these designs were significantly marred by their poor sound quality and inability to produce sound at a low volume. The modern design of moving coil loudspeakers was established by Englishman Sir Oliver Lodge, who, on April 27, 1898, received the second patent for a loudspeaker. This was the same year he applied for the patent on his famous radio tuner. The moving coil system commonly used today was patented in 1924 by Chester W. Rice and Edward W. Kellogg. Shortly after, Walter H. Schottke invented the first ribbon loudspeaker. Loudspeaker systems were generally poor up until the 1950s, when continuous development in enclosure designs and materials led to significant audible improvements. Some of the improvements were in materials used for the cone, higher temperature adhesives, improved permanent magnet materials, and computers aided in their designs. Stereo systems are state-of-the-art. Speakers amplify all songs from the start. Wires, tweers, speakers all do their part. So you can hear beautiful music like Mozart. They make you hear the sounds to tap your feet and sing along while you just dance to the beat. Without speakers, we would never hear the music. Radio and television would leave us clueless. Production of sound is similar with all objects. Sound is produced when it vibrates through air, solids, and liquids like whales sound in the water. Vibration moves the air particles around it. Those air particles in turn move the air around them. When this vibration reaches your ears, it vibrates our eardrums back and forth. Our brain interprets this action as sound. A basic speaker consists of a magnet, voice coil, spider, diaphragm, basket, dust cap, and suspension. Imagine what the world would be like if there were no aerosols, or speakers, or light bulbs. Well, that's our show for today. We hope you've enjoyed learning how light bulbs, speakers, and aerosols actually work and have a better appreciation for the people that invented them and the miracles of science that make these modern day conveniences possible. And we'll see you next week.